What is going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 14 of Eat, Speak, Compete. And I was able to get off the start of this episode without Luke interrupting my you first know, run at the intro. So it's a good week, folks. Welcome back. My name's Yeso. My name's name Shimonahi. My name's Shimonahi. You know, I don't, I don't think that was fair. Yeah? Uh, usually when we start the show, I'm able to do my warm-up uh, vocal routines. In the middle of me doing my intro. a lot of the times happens to coincide with you mm -hmm. trying to start the show. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to fault me for that. But you are right. We're back with an episode number 14. Yes. Uh, another big week for esports. Another big week for esports arena. So we're here to talk about it all. Yeah. Ton of stuff to cover today. Uh, obviously, big news with Halo. Some incredibly huge news about Smash that we're going to get into uh, on the show today. Tons of stuff to cover. And of course, we will be finishing the show for the final time talking about Arcane. So very spoiler heavy, heavy discussion about Arcane at the end of today's show. So look out for that one. If you haven't seen the show, get on Netflix, go watch it. You're probably going to have to search it. Luke hates that it isn't on the front page as soon as you open it up, but we've talked about that. But to start the show, let's talk a little bit of League of Legends news. Obviously, we talked about Worlds throughout the run of the tournament, and we got some big numbers back from Riot over the last week. Viewership numbers, Worlds viewership peaked all time during the finals at over 73 million viewers, which for reference is a 60% increase over last year's finals which was the previous all-time peak, somewhere I think around 48 million viewers. So an incredible year for League Esports. The, I would, in my opinion, the best world tournament overall of all time, the greatest finals of all time, and deservedly so, the most viewed League of Legends esport event of all time. Yeah, you know, it makes sense that it just keeps leaping so far ahead of itself mm -hmm. every year you know the the amount of growth that the the scene sees every like year over year is like way more than just a year's worth of sure. growth if you compare it to like the trends of like sports or other entertainment categories in general um so it's super awesome to see you gotta love it and it's just so cool to see how how quickly the world is continuing to develop and accept things like league of legends and it's crazy to look at an esport in its 11th year it's 11th world championship and when you think about a lot of esports the discussion is very frequently around you know developers always working on the next title esports a, a lot of scenes aren't supposed to last that long but you look at league which is having some of its biggest esports moments now again 11 years in and it doesn't seem to be slowing down whatsoever uh, you look at Smash, right? Melee just hit its 20th anniversary, and that still has a scene that would put a lot of other games less than half its age to shame. So it's incredible to see that I think what we are starting to see and what developers are starting to learn is that uh, these games don't necessarily have a set shelf life like it seemed a lot of people thought for so long that if you continue to be creative, uh, to be willing to innovate in formats uh, and rule sets and, and be willing to continue to invest and grow and change that your scene can continue to thrive in the future. As long as you can continue to put out a product that people love and connect with for whatever reason, you can continue to do great things. And uh, Riot continues to be at the cutting edge of that in esports. Yeah, you know, and I think that there's a certain component of when it comes to like the individual game titles that it's it's about the ecosystem mm -hmm. too right where it's not even just like an individual like the game by itself isn't you know it's not like it's holding itself up by just the individual yeah. game it's like the whole ecosystem is being developed alongside it like in riot's case especially obviously because they're like above and beyond everyone all other developers by you know tv and movies and music and you know xx and x mm -hmm. but um their, their whole ecosystem of uh, other game titles, you know, the, the lore stuff, like I mentioned, the, all the different other entertainment options that they're doing, that, that keeps League of Legends fresh and new, and it, and it allows it to introduce itself to new audiences, right? You take yep. a game like, you take a game like um, Smash Bros. the same way, you know what I mean? Super Smash Bros. Ultimate allows 
somebody to engage with Super Smash Brothers and learn about it, right? Then, you know, let's say they really like it, they start getting into it, they start getting good at it, they want to learn about the history of all the previous games, they find Melee, they start competing in Melee. Like, you could become a new Melee player, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be that crazy of an idea. But the concept of becoming a new Counter-Strike player? <laughs> You're crazy yeah. if you think Counter-Strike is getting new players. Because, like, how do you start in Counter-Strike as a day one player? Yeah. Like, what's, what's, what's bringing you into the Counter-Strike ecosystem in general, right? Nothing. You're probably just going to find, you're going to fall into the Valorant ecosystem. Yeah. Because you don't have a choice, almost, it feels like, right? As a brand, again, with no context of your exact situation, right? Like, I'd say the majority would end up in more of a, you know, completed ecosystem rather than something that's segmented off by a game itself. So, I won't rant on that piece for too long, but I really do think that, you know, a lot of these game titles or gaming communities that do have that longevity are very similar in the sense where they all have a very lo uh, a very strong foundation outside of the individual game itself. Yeah, and I mean, you can even speak in terms of like the esports scene and how that has grown. Um, five years ago, it was, you know, you had Challenger Circuit and LCS, and then obviously the other regional leagues and their, their forms of qualification into their leagues, and that was really it. And now what we've seen over the last five years is an incredible growth in the collegiate scene in North America and the amateur scenes and all the T2 scenes uh, officially uh, and then continued support from grassroots orgs. And obviously, you know, us, we, we still do League of Legends tournaments here at Esports Arena. So uh, not only has the, the esport officially at the top level, the tier, tier one level of League Esports has grown, but that foundation, as you talk about, has continued to grow uh, in so many different ways. So it's incredible uh, to see. And I think League's future is, is bright. I don't think that it, it's crazy to say this long in, but League of Legends does not seem to have peaked yet in any sense of the word. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing to talk about. Also, do you have to note, uh, we did get another announcement uh, on the League of Legends front with Worlds coming to North America once again next season. We actually got the announcement uh, of the locations for the different stages of the tournament next fall. Uh, it will start with play-ins in Mexico City, so which is sick. Uh, groups and quarterfinals will take place in New York City. The semifinals will be in Toronto, and grand finals will be in San Francisco. What uh, is kind of your just first blush reaction to that lineup of locations for Worlds next year? Sounds dope. I love it. It sounds super fun. Um, obviously, being closer to home for us is, is super cool. Mm -hmm. We get to wake up at a normal time and all that jazz. <laughs> so I guess I'm most excited to watch the games uh, when I'm supposed to be awake. Right. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't think it's been a while since it's been in North America. Uh, um, the last Worlds we had in North America was season six. Yeah. So, so it's been over. It will be essentially six years. Yeah, five, six years. So that's pretty cool to see it come back to North America. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been a hot minute. And who knows? Maybe it's our year. We'll have to see. Um, I'm very excited that Riot has embraced the North American aspect of it here, as opposed Canada, to little Mexico. Exactly, because for years, uh, it you know the last time Worlds was in North America it was exclusively in the U.S. Um, and I think Riot has slowly been uh, trying to push outside of that over the last few years. They've had LCS championships hosted in Canada, which is great to see, and then obviously finally getting. Mexico into the mix is incredible. Uh, I've heard great things about the location where they are going to be hosting things for play-ins in Mexico City. That's awesome. Uh, Mexico, I know, has a, a very passionate league fan base, so they've got to be incredibly excited about that. So that's super cool. Um, and just, you know, don't expect me to do anything at the end of October of 2022. Luke and I have plans after we go to Seattle for Halo. We'll be in San Francisco <laughs> for League. See us uh, there. So that's going to be awesome. Yeah. I'm definitely psyched about that. Love so it. Looking forward to it. Awesome news out of Riot and the League space. We'll talk more League later, but let's talk Smash. Highlighted it at the top. Some big news from the Smash community and some of the, I would say, the biggest news in Smash Esports in 20 years, and that is the fact that Panda Global has partnered with Nintendo of America to launch an official Super Smash Brothers circuit for Ultimate and Melee, and the, it's really the first time Nintendo has ever officially put their stamp on a professional Smash circuit. It's pretty groundbreaking here. Panda Global, obviously a big name in the space. Uh, what did you think when you saw this announcement? Um, well, obviously, it's, it's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting to see 
Nintendo kind of taking their first step into esports, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, their first step off of the necks of a lot of tournament organizers that have yeah. had to deal with them over the years. Well, it's it's pretty interesting, right? Because like they've always Nintendo's always got kind of a bad rap. Yeah. From the from the Smash Bros. space, and a lot of it's merited. Some of it's a little you know iffy and whatnot. Sure. Right? Nintendo's a non-American based company, yeah. right? They um, have a lot of red tape that they have to go through and a lot of different cultural components also that, that are in play there. They are a family based company, mm -hmm. not a competitive based, you know, company by, in, by yeah. any means. They, right? they didn't so, build the, the, the Smash game for this reason. Now that is all true. However, at the same time, the community picked it up and they could have easily, for lack of better terms, controlled it and instead just let it run rampant with itself, mm -hmm. which caused a, a myriad of other issues. So I'm not going to jump on either fence there because I think most people who are familiar with this category kind of understand what I'm saying. But yep. long story short is that Nintendo hasn't supported competitive esports ever. They've always done their kind of own little things here and there where maybe they would do like a pop-up at like a, an event. Mm -hmm. I don't, would it, be like, it would be like an officially sanctioned Nintendo event, but it would just be like, they would just be like in the back. You know, they wouldn't, like, maybe support the prize pool or they wouldn't, like, you know, it was, like, they were just, like, okay, here's our, here's our like, baby stamp on this specific one-off event. Mm -hmm. We're going to put up some booths and stuff. But it was never anything too intense, right? No, like, circuit or pro league or anything like that, right? This news is such a big deal because they're, like, it's, you know, the actual Nintendo. It's not items on. We're not talking online. You know what I mean? We're talking, like, a real circuit similar to probably what we might have seen in Smash 4 with the 2DGC the circuit that we ran. Um actually for not just ultimate but mm -hmm. also melee and i think that's the biggest part where i i, I mean melee was like all right is, is ultimate gonna kill it probably not but like it might it kind of stunned it and then covid pushed it even further smash took such a big hit through covid and to see it, smash bouncing back the way that it did without nintendo support and now nintendo coming in to actually support and with panda global at the helm of it like I don't know, man. That's it. It was so much. There was so much. So many thoughts. Not obviously enough information for me to tie my thoughts sure. to anything specific. But in general, I'm I'm really excited for the opportunity. I think um, the opportunity for the community. Obviously, the I think the Panda Global is a is a great um, is a great company to to kind of like lead that charge. Sure. I think they're they're a little hit or miss in like certain aspects. But when it comes to like, you know community trust and things like that like they're definitely up there mm -hmm. you know like i'm sure that they have a lot of people that will be involved anyway but you know it's a, a, honestly i have so many thoughts i feel like i could talk about it forever yeah. because it's like again i just want more information on it so that i can like you know actually know all the facts but long story short i think it's exciting i think we're we're on the right path i'm really i'm excited to see what nintendo can do with it and um and i hope panda global uh nails this opportunity because i don't think we'll get a second one yeah i agree if this will if this one you know, falters and has too many issues, like you probably won't see Nintendo ever coming back because obviously you're right. They, they have been so hesitant to do so. Uh, it, it does feel like for years, and maybe this is because, you know, when you, you kind of hit on it, right? Nintendo has for so long, especially with their first party titles, geared them, they're very family oriented. And especially when you look at the ensemble games like a Mario Kart, Mario Party, Super Smash Brothers Melee, uh, they weren't ever developed as competitive titles, but obviously Melee and subsequent games uh, have been picked up as ha competitive titles. And I would say, and I, again, I don't have any hard numbers behind this, but I would argue that a large majority of the Smash fandom is behind, is more towards the competitive side of the game. And, you know, maybe not necessarily players that are going to compete at their local every week, but they are at least in tune with that scene. Maybe they watch it a little bit. So it feels like, for me, finally, Nintendo, like it feels like you're finally addressing the largest portion of your Smash Bros. fan base now with this move. So uh, it feels like it's a long, it's been a long time coming. I'm excited. I'm excited for all the, you know, the, the Smash players, right? Because for me, this is this isn't something that affects me. I'm not really heavily ingrained in the scene. I obviously enjoy the game and, and, and like to watch it, but Nintendo's lack of a partnership has never done anything to me. But I think for the Smash players and the TOs and all those kind of folks that have had to push so hard for years uh, to build a scene that is entirely built on just grassroots, right? It's never been supported by Nintendo. And all of a sudden now, hopefully, this will be the start of 
all these people that such a, have such a love and passion for this title, getting the support that I think the scene deserves, I think is incredible. So um, I'm excited for them and I'm excited to see what comes of it. You know, I'm looking forward to some incredible smash events. I've still yet to be to, uh, have yet to go to my first like smash major. I've been to plenty of smash locals, but uh, there is certainly a smash major in my future and it could possibly be a Panda Global event in 2022. And I'm looking forward to that. I think it's awesome. Love it. Um, let's talk about the GOAT. Faker is back, has re-signed. Oh, no, no, no. We'll talk, you know, all right, all right. We talk about you enough on the podcast. We can, you know, if you That's want to fair. talk, we'll talk after the show. But <laughs> Faker is back. Uh, the mid laner of T1 has re-signed with the team, will return. Obviously, they finished top four at Worlds, getting into semifinals and eventually losing to Damwon Kia this year. Faker in the squad, I think, look poised to take over once again. I think the team looked incredible. They were incredibly young, but the system that they have built around Faker uh, is, I think, producing another all-star lineup that I think is going to certainly be a big threat next year. And Faker, obviously a key piece of that. Coming back to T1 is incredibly important. And, uh, you know, I think there was discussion about other teams trying to get after him. Of course, anytime any big free agent is open, TSM fans are going to be talking about, oh, well, we'll get him. We should get him, whatever. And then it's like, relax, TSM fans. You guys don't have to have everybody. But uh, I think it's only fitting that he goes back to T1. I think it would be, and of course, Faker can do whatever he wants. If he wants to go to another team at, at some point in his career, I will not be against that. But I think it would only make sense for him to play his entire career with T1 and retire with that organization. We'll see if maybe that happens with another world championship under his belt yeah no i mean i i, I knew i threw this story at you because you know i just love faker i'm a big yep, faker fan. Yep, I'm, yep. Big, I'm a big death adder <laughs> razor fan you know so like across the board i'm just a i love love to see it you know i'm i'd say i'm only i'm only a little disappointed in one thing about the announcement i feel like that i feel like he probably maybe could have gone to tsm so that was kind of a bummer but other than that you know obviously excited to see uh, faker back at the mm -hmm. at t1 should be another good good season we wanted to see the boys run it back so yeah we'll see what uh, what that year of experience did to the roster and uh, i was trolling for anyone who didn't pick that up obviously um i agree with jc on the staying at t1 <laughs> side but hey at the end of the day you can do whatever he wants but uh either way i just wanted to throw that in we don't have to harp, harp on it too long but let's go faker yeah he's the best yeah, I mean, hey, we'll, we'll be looking forward to it. Obviously, we love talking about League Esports. Faker is a big reason why. Uh, esports exists. Oh. I mean, <laughs> I, I, he's the father of all of our esports. <laughs> yep, he's our, he's our granddaddy. Uh, yeah, just congratulations, Faker. Congrats to T1. How and old is Faker? Look forward. Um, if I had to guess, I would say he's. They aged like they don't he was age. Young. So, like, it could I'm be pretty any, sure he, he was young any. when he came in, like 17 or 18. I was gonna if guess, I, like if I had to guess, I would say 25 or 26 okay. right now. Okay, you think he's younger on that younger side? Okay. Yeah, but uh, that's awesome. Um, let's talk a little esports awards. The esports awards happened oh, yeah. uh, over this past weekend. I kind of want to just kind of hit broadly uh, yeah, some of the big it. awards that came off. Uh, Shocks won host of the year. Congratulations, to her. She's awesome. Congratulations. She's an incredible Absolutely. host. Well deserved. Hunter Thieves wins Org of the Year. Simple won PC Player of the Year. Woo! Cadrel. Uh, former professional player, now analyst and caster for the LEC and uh, did uh, the World Finals this year, wins Analyst of the Year, which I think was incredible. Surprising to see that within a year's time of transitioning from pro play to uh, analysis, winning an award like that, I'm surprised in so much as that's such a quick turnaround. But at the same time, I think when I, watch, one. Yeah. when I watched Kadro last year at Worlds, I was like, this guy's insane. He's incredibly knowledgeable. He's crazy entertaining. I, I remember when he started the whole weak side police meme at last year's Worlds, which is hysterical. And he's uh, continued to develop his craft. And I think the, the growth that we've seen has been so much fun to watch. So uh, at the same time, while I'm surprised, I'm like, yeah, no, he was he was awesome. Like, well-deserved. Um, Valorant wins eSports Game of the Year. Also, shout out to our friends at Intel win commercial partner of the year let's go intel <laughs> uh intel if you guys don't know uh is the best yes uh brand <clears throat> almost probably almost cl close to the world like they're they're literally the goat i mean um, that uh, intel is one of if not the biggest brand in 
gaming and tech in the world. Yeah, they're, they're honestly just, and honestly too, one of the best partners to work with. Mm -hmm. Like they are, so, like their team is so great. They literally are so open to different ideas and building things out because that's what they do. They innovate, you know, they, uh, for lack of better terms, create your, make your problems easier. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like with technology and all that kind of stuff. So like we, 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 we have an Intel production room. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I love working with the Intel guys, Team Intel, obviously, all that kind of jazz. So big Intel fan. There you go. Yeah, so a lot of awesome news from uh, the eSports Awards there. Not really surprised that 100 Thieves won Org of the Year. They had a, a banging year wall-to-wall -wall winning I don't know the who else you would give it to. LCS Championship, right? So that's awesome. Simple winning PC Player of the Year. So not only does he get his major, gets an award at the eSports Award. And what are your thoughts on Valorant winning eSports Game of the Year? Uh, I mean, I think it fits. Honestly, like, I, I, I can't – you can't take it away from – like take away what Riot can do so easily, it feels like, mm -hmm. right? Like, you, <laughs> so many people have tried to start leagues recently mm -hmm. or over the last couple of years, and it's just like, literally, what is going on? You mm -hmm. know, and like they just fresh game, instantly created. Like obviously, the first you know several months, whatever it is, rosters were all over the place because the player base was still getting worked out. But it's like it's such a competitive and fun experience to watch mm -hmm. now, and like the, all the. Um, the cross-region events are crazy cool, and like the, of course, it's just League of Legends production quality, like the same kind of jazz you would expect. So, I'm honestly not really that surprised. I don't know who else I would give it to. Um, you know, I, I, for, I can't get Rocket League out of my brain when I think about esports okay. awards. Um, I think Rocket League is like, I don't want to say, I don't want to say like underserved or like undervalued because it's like has such crazy viewership. I just yeah. feel like it's always forgotten about when you talk about like esports stuff because it's not a shooter. Right? Yeah. It's, not, it's not the main shooter. It's not the main fighting game. It's not the main MOBA. MOBA, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, and you know, but it's it's like whole own category, and it's so popular. Has such a great circuit system, great production, tons of top tier teams. Um, so Rocket League obviously is always kind of up there in my brain too. But again, like based on when Valorant came out to where it is now, it totally makes sense. I think Valorant's just incredible. It feels like you, you mentioned like other people trying to start leagues and stuff. It feels like a lot of games and developers and whatever try to throw money at these problems and i really get the sense that riot throws creatives and people mm. at these problems when they want to start something new like this it feels like they obviously with all the experience that they've had with league have learned an incredible amount they've obviously made more than their fair share of mistakes uh, and it feels like they very much have an understanding of their titles and then what will work from them and they have continued to build incredible environments around them you know uh we aren't going to go super depth on it but we can highlight the fact that you know wild rift their their mobile version of league of legends just had their first like international LAN. uh that went off incredibly well legends of runeterra has been huge uh, i think they recently had a tft world championship so all of a sudden over the last couple of years riot went from having one game to now having, what, f five, right? League, Wild Rift, Valorant, Legends of Ruterra, TFT. And it feels like they haven't misstepped almost at all in terms of building out these ecosystems and uh, they continue to just crush it. So uh, I'm not surprised. I think Valorant has done an incredible job. Obviously, they're coming up to their world championship here next month, month with which should be incredible i'm looking forward to it we'll be doing some uh we'll have to do some bracket stuff because we do have Ooh. the bracket release so oh it's uh, we out? will have that yes okay we should do it this week then. so we'll do it yeah we'll probably do it over this week we are uh very excited about that that's gonna be fun but you know hey valorant crushing it riot continuing to crush it so uh love love to see that so big news there from the esports awards let's talk a little bit of drama mm. stream labs <laughs> um, oh, if you guys aren't on Twitter, you probably have, or, or Reddit, you've probably missed a lot of this discussion, but there was a little snafu last week. Uh, Streamlabs put out, and I guess published live on their website, a page detailing advertising whatever their console streaming service that the, they're coming out with. They're partnering with Xbox and PlayStation, I believe. I know for sure Xbox. Um, but it started when this came out and Lightstream, another company that does some uh, work with streaming products for, for people at home, uh, put out a tweet and said, you know, it, it was basically the, like, uh, hey, can I copy your co homework? Yeah, just make it a little look a little different. It was 
their page about their console streaming service right next to Streamlabs, and it was the same thing. Verbiage was exactly the same. The, the format, layout. exactly the same layout. Yeah. Oh my god. They basically. So that long story short is that Streamlabs copied their website yes. word for word. And Streamlabs' response was like, "Oh, we're sorry. It was like placeholder text. We fixed it. We reached out to Lightstream to apologize." And it's like, first of all, that's bullshit because <laughs> you literally did. It was the same page, like it was advertising essentially the same kind of service, and it literally looked exactly the same. You can literally one to one, like you can lay them on top of each other, and they look the same. Even if you change the words a little bit, the words aren't even necessarily the biggest problem there. It was literally like, can I walk your dog? And it was like, can I walk your dogs? Yeah. That was like literally the day I added yeah. an S to the sentence, and it yeah. was like, nope. We got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, a penalty. So that's where this all started. And then there was some interesting follow-up afterwards because then there was a tweet later from the official OBS Twitter account. They later came out and said that Streamlabs came to them when they were working on releasing the product and basically asked, hey, can we use the OBS name? Because Streamlabs is built off of OBS. the OBS framework, which is open source, completely free, um, and so they came to OBS and said, hey, can we use the name? And OBS said, hey, no, we would prefer you don't. And Streamlabs basically went, yeah, fuck you. We're going to file a trademark and use it anyway. Um, and so OBS came out and said, yeah, no, they did that. And so now over the last week, Streamlabs has been getting absolutely bodied. A lot of the biggest creators in the space coming out, speaking against them, saying that you know if they do use Streamlabs, they're not going to use it anymore. Uh, to the point where Streamlabs came out and announced they were dropping OBS from their name, which is like the smallest of first steps in this process. But uh, what is your kind of reaction to all of this fallout we've gotten to watch and just see seeing <laughs> Streamlabs just getting bodied over the last few days? Yeah, I was honestly kind of confused at first because like I feel like Streamlabs is like almost, I don't want to say like household, right? But it's like everybody knows Streamlabs. Yeah. Most people use Streamlabs. Yeah, I mean, it's to like, be clear. That's what I have used streaming from home for years, and it's a product I very much enjoy. I started with OBS, and there were a lot of quality of life features in Streamlabs that I just made my life easier. That's what it's for, I'm, right? I'm an idiot. Just like I don't OBS, know what I'm doing. Just like OBS said in their post, it's like they're open source. Yes. That's what they're for. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, they, and even though they were upset, they were like, we're still going to provide it. Like They can do whatever they want, whatever. But overall, it was just like I, I was pretty surprised that this is the first time like anything negative from Streamlabs has like really come out. Big. Yeah. Like I'm saying small things here and there, but like to this scale, like mm -hmm. it was massive. And it's like, it seemed like it was, there were so much, un so many underlying issues that were just like getting like glanced over, which, yeah. you know, it's kind of annoying. Cause again, like all these big creators who maybe knew some of the stuff who now, yeah, I don't know. But either way, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was pretty, I thought it was pretty crazy how much heat they took so fast out of what set, what seemed like nowhere. Yeah. But get scammed because yeah. I guess they were scamming. So yeah. I mean, all, all I'll say is, like, good on the community for coming out and backing up OBS, even if it's, like, not necessarily the streaming product that I prefer. And, again, this is because I am stupid. And Streamlabs was just, like, streaming for idiots. So I was like, oh, that's, that's perfect for me. Um, we got to try out Light Show or whatever it's called. Lightstream, yeah. Lightstream, yeah. yeah. Um, I will say this. If you've seen this, I would say, uh, and, and you're not sure what's going on, I would say just support OBS. You don't even have to donate money but like if you're a streamer just use obs drop Streamlabs. uh i think one of the uh big things that has come out of all of this fallout is all of these people who've been coming out and saying hey you can just go use obs like there's they've added a lot of features over the last couple of years a lot of i've seen a lot of people putting out videos like hey do you want to strip you know switch from Streamlabs to obs here's how here's all these things so i would say you know if you're uh if you see this and you're like wow that's kind of shitty I, but i use Streamlabs." There are the resources out there, and just go support OBS. I think it is an incredible project. Uh, it's been going on for so many years. Everybody who has ever streamed has touched the the program, uh, and it's a large credit to the people who developed it. So, shout outs to OBS. You know, hey, when I streamed, I was only OBS. There so you go. That's it. I didn't. That's all. Yeah, but it's just a, <laughs> a, a crazy, weird, random out of the blue story that just yeah. kind of cropped up out of nowhere the last That's week. That's what it so felt like. Imagine if Streamlabs had just, you know, not carbon copied that light stream stuff, maybe they would have been able somebody to avoid got, Somebody got fired for that one. I'm yeah. sorry that much. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's an L. F's in the chat for Streamlabs there. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Blizzard. Oh, no. Um, just everyone's on fire. Welcome to a recurring segment on our show called <laughs> Blizzard Fucked Up Again. And What's Yezo Blizzard Shimoni, up to this week? Yeah, and Yezo and Shimoni, he have to talk about it. Um, oh, you know you know what's funny is I, I don't even have, like, because I, I already know what happened, but I don't even have notes here. I literally just wrote, Blizzard is still an absolute mess on my card. That's all it says. Uh the overarching stuff that we've learned over the last couple of weeks is uh, a lot of bad stuff about Bobby Kotick, who is the current uh, CEO of Activision Blizzard. What? Threatened to kill uh, an employee. Knew about a lot of the abuse for years and did nothing about it. Uh, there was also the note that they hired uh, those two folks to work together and head Blizzard. And it was a man and a woman. And they paid the woman less. It was like, dude, you're literally getting sued right now for unfair treatment of women in the workplace, and you thought it was a good idea to pay your female CEO who has a male com- counterpart less than her male counterpart. Like, it- it's incredible. So uh, there has just been more and more bad stuff coming out about Blizzard, and I would say that... What was the quote? What was the Bobby quote? Was it... That he may con- I may consider leaving the company if, if I'm I unable if I'm unable to fix the company culture. Uh, news flash, you missed. Okay, and Swing you're a part of that and problem miss, with the okay? company culture, dude. Like it could not be more clear. Yeah, I mean we could we won't sit here and tie your guys' ears off too long about Blizzard, but uh, we we can tell you that it, they're still on fire. Yes, that their executive team has not solved this has not fixed the solution. Yep. Um, and I'm sure that we will have an enormous amount of more news. Wait, wasn't there a petition? 1,200 employees signed a petition calling for Bobby Kotick to step down. How many CEO. employees do they have? I don't know Quick off Google the top search. of my head, but I would argue, Google search. I would argue 1,200 is a pretty good chunk. How many? Like, I would say that's at least... A third? 4,700. So let's call it, let's call it 5,000 rounding. Okay. So that's about 25%. Yep. Close enough. So, and that's, that's not just great. the people that signed the petition. I mean. Yeah, that's not, that's not a great number. <sighs> You're not doing great with that. I just like. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say stay tuned for that one, guys. Yeah, uh, we got more news coming. This, every this week story is obviously going to developing. continue to develop, and we're gonna continue to talk about it as it does. It just bums me out. I mean, you look at the incredibly talented people that have worked at Blizzard for so long, and all of the wonderful products they have put out that so many folks, like yourself, for example, have connected to in so many different ways and play. Uh, you know whether it's the reason they got into games or it's why they fell in love with it or you know maybe they met the people that they love through these titles and it's just incredibly disappointing because I feel like there's so many good people and good creatives behind all of this and so many good people that love and have supported the company for so long and to see so many who have been allowed to abuse their power who have been allowed to get away with all of these things for so long and that seemingly the top people in Blizzard continue to enable this behavior because the, uh, like, what is it, the executive board or the board of directors voted to keep Bobby in power. It just seems like all of the people who deserve to be treated well and the support that they should get is just not getting there because Bobby makes the company money, I guess. I don't know. Couldn't tell you. You want to know what makes the money? Call of Duty. Everything else? Nope. Yeah. See ya. Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, again, like I, I, I just don't. I don't really have any. I don't really have any notes, I guess, to add to the yeah. overall debacle because I would basically just sit here and talk about how, like, I feel like probably the majority of the actual like um, generational talent, like the talent that comes around once a generation, if you will, that we used to work at Blizzard does not work there anymore. I, fi- I would find that very hard to believe that any of them were really stuck around Mm -hmm. and the ones that did stick around are probably completely gated and if you're listening which i doubt you are but if you are listening leave you know what i mean like there are so many developers out there 
indie developers or AAA developers that need super talented people. Mm -hmm. Look at Riot. That is not a one-man show. Let me tell you that. That is a massive team, dozens of massive teams creating those type of things. And it's just like, you know, having the, like, the lead creator creatives of like all these different like of overwatch and of diablo and of this and that like just continuously leave like you can't just replace that yeah you know so Man. yeah we'll talk about it more as as things continue to come out but at the very least you know that activision blizzard is still uh an absolute mess mm. for a lot of different reasons but let's talk about a developer that we love mm. around these parts these days and that's our friends over at 343 uh we <laughs> talked about it on last week's episode obviously we got to sit down with our good friend shyway and talk about his origins in halo and then talk about obviously the new title halo infinite that dropped last monday and with now a week in the books it has been quite a week uh for halo for the hcs team and everybody over there at 343 there's a ton to talk about uh they had their First tournaments over the weekend, uh, the North American HCS Open Qualifier finished with a full 10-game bracket reset between C9 and Optic. This mm -hmm. was a C9 squad that up until Grand had not dropped a single map. Optic gets the win in the first best of five for, to force the reset in five games, and then the second series goes a full five games, and Optic ends up winning uh, viewership peaked at over 56,000 people on Twitch. Uh, it was a huge weekend for the Halo team. Yeah, it was, it was, I honestly, it was such a long tournament. There's so many things going on. I didn't even finish watching the whole thing yet. Right? Um, yeah, I mean, they had B streams. I think yeah. it started, I think the North American tournament alone started with over 400 teams. Yeah, I'm working. Can you imagine just trying to run that tournament? Dude, I'm, wor I'm working my way through it. <laughs> let me tell you that. Um, but it, it really it really was uh, incredible. Halo's yeah. totally coming back. You know, the, the viewership was dope. The, the talent was incredible. Uh, and honestly, the gameplay was a blast to watch. Mm -hmm. Holy agree. crap, it was so intense. The finals was, you can, you, it's, I love saying this, the esports storyline always writes itself. Mm -hmm. Like a 10 game bracket reset first like tournament of infinite, like get out of here. Yeah. That only happens in like movies and esports yeah you know what i mean it's always like that you know and <laughs> you get like real sports it's always like a wash you know you're in the <laughs> you're in like the finals and somebody's getting smacked bro but in esports it's, i love how close it always gets down to and also the teams and the rosters that they have of like the top um let's just say like the top 10 teams right now um i i, I can't even like imagine a world where like some of them have to be like the worst ones like, you know what I mean? Like, the, the, the rosters all look so terrifying. Yeah. Like, who's the best team? Like, those 12 teams are the best team. Because, like, I, how do I even pick one team? Like, they just, they're, they're like, all monsters. Like, their mm -hmm. teams are crazy. Like, it's just going to be wild, and I can't wait to see what develops out of it. It was really cool for me, too, because I've spent, you know, over six months now, right, doing Halo 5 on Sundays. And I get, I, I only get to see the mishmash rosters, which are fun to an extent but but you know the what names. i really yeah, yeah so i know the names but it was finally cool to see the entire cloud nine roster together yeah. the entire sentinels roster playing together and it delivered sentinels big time do it. right I and thought, they get yeah. upset in 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 uh losers, losers finals, finals by yeah. optic which was insane so uh hats off to the entire halo team there was a lot of discussion uh, specifically, and it's, this is mostly because I follow a lot of them, but a lot of pros uh, from a lot of the pros in the Apex scene talking about the kind of developer support for the esports scene that Halo got off the rip. And obviously, this comes from the fact that Halo's not new to this, right? They've been doing esports in Halo forever. HCS has been well known for a long time and has been around and doing this. So this is not their first rodeo by any stretch. But very specifically, you see, you see. All the partner team skins on release they have the first year roadmap ready to go and released at the release of the game so everybody knows what's going on their first major tournament is less than a month from release of the game they have huge tournaments within seven days of the game dropping and while there are not you know it's not like the last week was entirely perfect i think there was certainly criticism to be thrown at 343 for things like the battle pass progression and things like that there's 
been a little bit of issues with cheaters and connectivity stuff uh, in the game, but I think specifically 343 has one been incredibly responsive to these criticisms. Um, but overall, even with those hitches, I think the last week is an A plus for Halo. I don't know that, you know, other than those few things being ironed out, it couldn't have gone much more perfect than it did. Yeah, you know, it's so funny because, like, for me, like, one of the hard, like, one of the things I, that really turns me off from a game is not being able to play the game. And you've heard me talk about that yes. before, right? Where it's like, if I, have, if I have a hard time actually just sitting down and playing the game, it'll, it'll, it'll... Rest in peace for our... It, it will. It'll, it'll take <laughs> away my drive and my interest in that game completely. Yep. I don't care about the Even developer, if it's fixed a few the weeks Twitter, from then. Yeah. The, the, the esports events are going on, because I never got a chance to enjoy it for myself. And because mm -hmm. of that, I don't care if someone else is enjoying it. I can't even play the game. Yeah. And that happened to me a little bit with Halo, where, like you mentioned, there was, you know, some, some issues here and there, right? I got, like, uh, like I got disconnected from a game because I had, like, a bug, and then I got banned because I left the game, and then I lost, like, a rank, and I was like, Wah! you know, like, <laughs> and it literally made me, like, turn off the game for the night, but it, it honestly, like, didn't ruin my overall experience with Halo because I feel like I've had mostly highs with the game, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't even be able to play the game at all right now. Right. Like, we're in, they're, they're literally, like, I, I, to me, this is just, like, a massive stress test for them. Yeah. Where they were like, all right, we did, we did close this, we did private that. They've always been testing and doing it a lot to make sure that it would go well. But they were mm -hmm. like, okay, the only thing we haven't done is open the floodgates. So open the floodgates. Yeah. So they open up the floodgates. Everyone comes rushing in. I think they've handled it totally fine. And I bet that on launch day, on December 8th or whatever, yeah. there's official launch day, um, that there'll probably be some patches that, you know, hopefully... Most people don't have any of those kind of issues, but you know they flagged it as beta, so I can't really complain. I'm playing the beta. Yeah. I lagged out of a beta game. Oh no, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like I'm sure I'll get to redo my um, my placements, even though my MR will probably still exist regardless, which is also a benefit. Sure. Um, so uh, I totally agree. I, I've, I've been really enjoying it, and I uh, I can't I can't wait to see what's next for Halo. Yeah, I think the future looks incredibly bright. One thing I do want to talk about at that future one announcement we got from HCS. Uh, is about co-streaming, and this has been something that's been talked about a lot with many different esports titles over the last couple of years. It's certainly something that, to an extent, uh, Riot has embraced with the LCS and other leagues. Um, but HCS announced that there will be open co-streaming. There will be a partner program with exclusive drops for people in the partner program, but HCS co-streaming is open to anybody. If you like Halo, and you want to co-stream, you can just co-stream HCS events, which I think is crazy. I mean, I never would have imagined we would get something like this, but it's awesome. I mean, it makes me think like, wow, you know, if there's an HCS, like a major that I can't make it to, but I'm excited about and I want to talk about, I could just stream and co-stream the event and talk about it with my friends. And I think that is awesome. And it's obviously HCS embracing the Halo community that is coming back in full force here for Infinite. They're obviously going to be bringing on a ton of new fans with the way they have set things up, the hype around the game, the fact that it's free to play. And another, in my opinion, incredible decision from 343 and the Halo team that they're just like, hey, you want to co-stream our events? It's more eyeballs on our events. Go for it. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Anyway, yeah, stream. Every, let everybody stream. Yep. Don't, delays, nope. Not unless people are cheating. Like, cool. you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's we're, we're always that way here you sure. know what i mean like because we we basically host hub streams mostly mm -hmm. here like that's kind of like really what we do so like everyone who competes in our events is all well, everyone is streaming you know what i mean so it's just it's just how you engage the community you know what i mean like you never want to put any any blockers up that could uh reduce the experience for anybody you know what i mean so i think that's, I'm, I'm super cool i think that's dope i'm sure we'll do plenty of co-streams so yeah. prep yourselves Looking forward Twitch to Twitch.tv forward slash esports arena. You know what it is. Yes, check it out. Uh, last thing before we get into our arcane discussion. Big weekend uh, in Apex. We saw the return to the LGS Pro League for the second half of Split 1. Real quick, get smacked. Go ahead. Yep. Team Esports Arena finishes first place. Uh, it's actually the first time they have finished first overall on a single day. Yep. I believe it was second, second, and third through the first three weeks. But they grabbed their, their first... First place finish here in week number four. Uh, it keeps them in first place overall in the league. It has also meant that they are the first team to lock in for the split one playoffs. They will compete on LAN. Uh, there's obviously a ton of storylines to talk about with Team Esports Arena, but let's just start there with their success on Sunday. Uh, easily the best three-man roster in North America. Yep. Uh, I was talking last week that I didn't agree, and now I'm flipping. 
they're insane. You know what I mean? Like again, I was ahead of the curve. Hey, what can again, I say? again, the land, <laughs> my, my uh, the points I made last week obviously are, are still hold pretty true. Sure. But regardless, just the the amount of consistency that these guys are dropping is it's starting to break me mentally. I can't even believe it. Mm-hmm. It's, it seems surreal. We haven't seen a team of this much dominance since TSM on land. Yeah. So uh, big fan. Uh, can't wait to see where they go. Do you want to talk about? Some of the rumors, some ru- rumors, some of the discussion that's been going on mm. over the, the over the weekend, you know, uh, snipe down going to Halo, which is uh, which is confirmed now. He's come out. There's now a hole on this TSM roster, and there's been a lot of talk about who's going to fill that hole. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of rumors. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and, and dive into it too deep or, or okay. give any like hard confirmations. People can do their own research and find mm-hmm. their own. And, and find their own holes on Twitter to fall through as there's sure. plenty of people farming for cloud on Twitter right now. Yes. And that's been great. Which, that's been very enjoyable to witness. Yeah, I was going to say, it's been very entertaining. Yeah, so uh, I'm all about that. But of course, there's there's always um, there's always going to be rumors in, in that kind of sense, especially when we have a team as, as strong as we have now and a team as strong as TSM is, is, is losing one of their, their main fraggers. So, you know, the, the purpose of Series E, which is where, um, which is where, Esports Arena's team is from. Verholz, Dupe, and Skittles started playing in, with each other in Series E to, mm-hmm. you know, get a sponsorship through our, our program that allows people to, of any skill level, to compete. And if they're the best in, in that group, then they get signed. And mm-hmm. These guys were the best in their group. They were able to get signed to Team Intel. And uh, through the new ALGS official rules, each brand can only have one team represent themselves. Yeah. So as they won Season 3 as Team Intel, they then earned the opportunity to be Team Esports Arena and compete inside the Pro League um, as they qualified into the Pro League as well. And, you know, it never, it never was our intention to own uh, a professional organization in that sense sure. e- anyway, but just because of the way that the ALGS kind of developed, it, it ended up kind of turning into that. And, you know, we're always trying to support our Series E players and, and give them a foundation to get noticed. That's the whole goal. And these guys really did go through the system exactly as it was intended prove themselves, get noticed, and now look how popular and interested they are to the point where as soon as TSM has a player that's leaving their, their team, the immediate thought is, oh, it's got to be one of Esports Arena's players because we sure. have the best players. Because all of the players, all of the talents, even the people who are on a lot of the current pro teams in Apex, right, CLG or you know Pittsburgh Knights or whomever, whatever rosters they are, they also came out of our system. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we're just kind of spreading our seeds a little, hand our cookie jar a little bit of everywhere, uh, if you will, because, you know, we're, we're providing the best practice in North America. Yep. It's not, it's, there's, there's no question about it, right? Like, pretty much no esports, <laughs> uh, no esports um, uh, community or uh, ecosystem in North America has a really good practice regimen. Yeah. Like, it doesn't exist. Esports Arena's Series E program is built to enhance that, not only the foundational concept of getting it, you know, your first step into that professional career, but also to create a practice component where the best of the best players can then compete against these up-and-coming players and really either hone their skills, find a new player, find a new third, whatever yep. it might be. Like, that's the whole goal. Right, and we're proving Apex Legends that we really can create the best practice regimen in North America. Look at all the top players; a lot of Series E names in there. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, so overall, that's what Series E is built to be. You know what I mean? Series E is built to harvest and farm these top tier players and give them a platform to get noticed by teams like TSM. So yeah. that's that's really what it's all about. Yeah, uh, I will say, while I you know I don't have any any insight on the situation, if things are happening, what is going on? Uh, you know, I don't work for TSM, I am not involved. I just get to talk about the teams on camera. Um, but I will say, obviously there's been a ton of speculation about a team from a player from Esports Arena going to TSM. And I will say this, Team Esports Arena is still, in my opinion, the best team in North America right now. And I think even if you lose a player from that roster, it does hurt them. But I would argue that this team is still incredibly good would have to bring in a replacement if this did end up happening. And I would argue that they could still be a top three team at LAN as long as they're able to incorporate this new third uh, in a relatively quick fashion because I think Team Esports Arena has very specifically been greater than the sum of its parts. I think it is consisted of three very talented players in Verhol, Skittle Cakes, and Duplex, but I think they have all been better on this roster than they were separately specifically because this combination this chemistry that they found has been incredible so i think obviously 
remove a player from any roster is going to set them back a little bit. But I think the thing that I'm most excited about is that even if you take one player off of this team, the other two are incredibly talented, have great chemistry, and are very, very good in their own right. So I'm incredibly excited to see no matter what happens, this team, I think, will continue to succeed because of the foundation that they have built, all the practice and the time that they put in, whether it's in Series E or other events in the ALGS. I think they are just in incredible, and I think the future is bright, and I'm incredibly excited for the last few weeks of the regular season of ALGS and the coming split one playoffs. I think it's going to be awesome. See you guys at land. There you go. Looking forward to that. Last part of the show, we'll do it one more time. It's time to talk about Arcane mm. Act 3. Spoilers. <laughs> Rasengan. Whatever you want to do, Kyle. This is my Have fun with it. I really this is my spoiler <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> I really I'm loved off the... camera, though. I got it. I loved the little pizza that you were, like, passing around. Oh, yeah. Did the, like, the little web slinger. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. But uh, we're talking about... The final act of Arcane Season 1 right now. If you haven't seen it, maybe you were waiting until it was done. You weren't quite sure it was going to be for you. Watch it. Mm. It's on Netflix. All nine episodes are out right now. It's also not very long. The, ever, the episodes average like 35 minutes, so it's not super long. Uh, go watch it. All I'm going to say, go watch it. It is 100% worth your time. Whether you like League or not, it is worth your time to go watch and that is the end of our spoiler warning, Luke. Hmm. I just, before we really get into the nitty gritty, I just want to know, what did you feel after finishing the last episode of Act 3? What was kind of going through your brain? Um, just that I wanted more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so hard in this situation because the universe that they're building mm -hmm. is so big yeah it's like knowing it's like watching like the first captain america movie or like the first iron man movie and knowing what happens like knowing that it's gonna like what the avengers means all that kind of stuff it's like watching that very first movie and just like being like oh my god it, it, watching it as like a comic book fan like you yes. read yeah you know where that's because you're sitting go. there and you know you see nick fury walking at the end of the first captain america movie knowing that they're about to like start the avengers Spoil up. spoiler <laughs> alert for <laughs> captain <laughs> america you, you know what yeah, i mean no. <laughs> like that like yeah. that whole creation of that whole like all and it's just building and it's building you got hulk and you know you get all these different mm -hmm. avengers in and you know where it's gonna meet at the end with the Avengers movie, and then it's this big Avengers movie, and it's so fun, and all this stuff. It's like, that's literally where we're at right now, right? Sure. Like, they, they literally like, Noxus. Noxus. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you want some Noxus? Here you go. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm all, where's Darius? You know, I'm like <laughs> screaming at the TV. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely, it left me wanting more for sure. Um, and I just like, I was just like popping off at the animation. Dude, and, oh. like the, and like the music. Well, yeah, I think there's one specific scene where we will dive into it's a little just, bit. But. It's, it, it, I, said it, I said it pretty much every single time specifically. Like the animation around like Jinx's, for lack of better terms, split personality. Mm -hmm. oh, I just, I don't know. It's something about it like gets me, man. Mm -hmm. It really is just like, I think it's so like so artistic and difficult to like cultivate a lot of those scenes with Jinx. And they're, they're all so just, mwah. Ah, man, I had a lot of feelings. I will say, my initial reaction after finishing it, after all of, you know, well, after I wiped all the tears off of me and got the snot off of my fucking face, it was, I was a mess. But um, my initial reaction was, I do want more. But, and this is probably coming because I'm like a League fan and I know like the eventual endpoint of the lore for these characters. I finished the show and I thought, cool i actually don't feel like i need to see a season two of these characters okay um as you talk about that universe is so big there's so many different places they could go stories that they could tell characters they can explore then my initial reaction was okay where are we going next do we get the blessed isles do i get to see shirima do we go to noxus can i see ionia and it's not like, and I said this earlier to Stephanie when we were talking about it, I, and this has been announced, to be clear. Uh, one, season two is under production. Two, Vi, Caitlin, and Jinx will be back as a part of season two. So they will be around. But my initial thought was like, 
If there is no Vi, Caitlin, or Jinx, and we go somewhere completely different with season two, super psyched. If we do, which is going to be the case, I'm going to watch the shit out of it. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to love it. I'm there for it. But my initial reaction was like, hey, cool. Like, let's go somewhere else. I felt like those nine episodes was like a good finish and a good close. And like, yes, to an extent, there are left on like a bit of a cliffhanger, but it felt like cool. It felt like a complete story that was told and I was like ready to move on. So uh, I'm curious to see where they go next with these characters' stories. But um, what are your thoughts on Silco? Is Silco, like, where does he rank in terms of, like, best characters in season one? Where would you put him? Yeah, I don't know. It, it, was, it was honestly hard. I liked a lot of the characters mm-hmm. in general. I felt like, you know, everybody was, like, kind of doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. Like everybody was kind of doing what they thought they had to do. You know, it's one of those it's one of those universes where you know, it's not necessarily like, oh, this group's the good guys and this group's the bad guys. You know, I didn't really necessarily feel that where like you look at Piltover and you're not like, "Oh, well, Piltover's the good guys." Like absolutely not. I think we're all on the same page sure. that nobody watching the first three episodes and thought Piltover was the good guys, yeah. you know? And you know, they obviously with Silco you get the villain-esque vibes because he's like the underground ruler, you know, yeah. kind of what I mean. But at the same time like You know, he was just a badass. You know, he was super hard. Mm -hmm. Like, he just, you know, I I was a big fan of the, uh, I don't know, lack of a better term, douchey-looking rich guy with the lighter. Oh. You know, it's just (laughs) like that whole whole entire interaction over the last, like, two episodes or three episodes Mm -hmm. they were in together. I was a big fan of that whole storyline because Mm -hmm. it was just, like, total just, like, mob boss mentality vibes, right? Yeah. Um, with, but just like with a huge, glaring, massive weak spot, like all mobs boss have, which is their daughter, which is yeah. huge. It's like so. It was so like right in the stereo type that I loved it. Um, so I really liked Silco. I thought he was a super cool character. I loved him and Jinx's relationship. Um, I know for a fact he would not have sold her out. No way was he selling her out. And it's just it's the exact same thing happened to Jinx twice. Yeah. The first time was when Vi got upset. She stormed away, called her a jinx, yeah. stormed away, saw Silco behind her, went to run back, boom, chloroform out of there, right? Mm-hmm. Didn't get to actually finish the sentence. Or when she w- he was talking to the spiky-haired kid and was like, you're the problem, but, you know, she only heard the first p- half of the sentence. It's like the same thing keeps yeah, happening yeah, to her where she's like, off. she's not, she's eavesdropping and not hearing the whole conversation. Mm-hmm. And so she keeps getting these, like, you know, schizophrenia nonsense is, like, mm-hmm. flipping back and forth. So it's just so unfortunate because I know, you know, he was, they were going to they were take over the world. So yeah. I don't know. It kind of sucks because, like the, like, the whole time they're trying to make you, like, not like Silco and make Silco the bad guy. And then, like, all of a sudden they make you, like, love. They make him the dad character and they make you, like, feel so bad for him at yeah. the same time. So that was pretty brutal. Um, he probably got what he deserved at the end of the day because he probably could have done a better job. <laughs> but, you know, he is running. He is running the underground, which is just, like, getting stepped on by Piltover. So it's, it's such a hard cycle. Yeah. So I'm cool. I'm cool, Silco. I'm sad he died. I would say he is for me top three characters. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed him. Uh, a special shout out to, and I can't remember his name, but the the voice actor that performed him in the show. The performance was just oh, just mm. Chef's Kiss was so good. Um, I agree. I didn't think he was going to sell her out. I completely believe him there, especially because it felt like what he had been fighting for the entire time from day one was right there and the only hang up was you've got to give jinx in and i actually 100 percent believe he would throw all of that away from her for her and i think their the development of their relationship was incredible i also do want to issue a bit of a retraction because i rewatched part two with my mom last night and i remember on our last episode i talked about how i thought their relationship was a little weird at the start and looked kind of oddly sexual or whatever. And I actually rewatched that part and I was just like, I think I was overanalyzing that part. I rewatched it. I actually don't think it was weird at all. I think the way that they developed their relationship was really well done, was really interesting. And his moment at the end where he's just like, I would never give them to, uh, give you to them. You're perfect. I was just like, oh so just broke my heart um so i thought silco was incredible we get the finish with you know obviously powder is now completely dead and vi sees that and how about the little finish where we get fish bones comes out 
she hits him with the super mega death rocket at the council chamber in Piltover. What did uh, what did you think there, seeing that just finish to the show? Um. So like, I rewatched that scene a couple times, mm-hmm. and like paused a couple times because like Caleb was like, "That didn't happen," and I'm all watch it in slow motion <laughs> because like it's the first time i watch it yeah. mel notices the rocket first yeah mel literally she knows mm-hmm. so she senses the rocket whatever this or that she activated zonia's dude she <laughs> she i, I saw that meme I'm, on I'm like i literally i'm, like, no. I'm sitting there and i was like i was like she's going zonia's <laughs> zonia's i literally like right dude that was me that was me in my living room the first time i oh watched it i backed God, it up and i was dude. like right there she's got a stopwatch she literally <laughs> activated zone and it's i'm only i'm only half oh. kidding right because i really do think that she saves jace and victor okay so what i think happened i think everyone in that room is dead with the exception of jace and victor yep. and her i think she did some kind of lack of better term i think she's a character that's coming out obviously i think there's a lot of rumors and stuff like that or whatever but um, oh, in the game. I think she's a game. She's a support character that's going to come out. Oh, okay, I that think, would be interesting. I think that she has some kind of shield of of some kind or whatever. I don't think she was able to fully block the blast. I think that Victor's going to do some crazy magic stuff. I think you know some kind of combination of crazy Victor magic and Mel Shield yeah. is going to save Jace's life. Yeah. Um, and Victor's going to go crazy out of it, but we know. Oh man. What do you think about that that scene? Because I, I was like, I was like, <laughs> I just like watching her walk out. And I remember because I, I, I hadn't really thought about it during the show, but as she walks out with the, the gemstone, I thought, oh, I was like, are we going to get to see fish bones? We haven't seen it the whole show. She's just had her Gatling gun. I'm like, are we going to get to see it? And then she pulled it up. I was like, oh, and then she fired the rocket. I was like, oh, and then I was like, wait, I was like, wait, where's that going? And I was like, oh, no. Um... I think there's so much to talk about and we are going to sit here for like another half hour, but it, it, I want to ask you before I kind of rattle off a handful of things that I want to discuss before we close the show. Is there anything specifically that you want to touch on character moment fight, whatever that you specifically want to get into? Um, I mean, two things were just like, uh, I think Singe as a character was insane. I thought he was like one of the, I think best characters in the whole show. I he was really even, cool. He literally blew my socks off. And especially for the amount of screen time that he had, I actually think they did a good Absolute job. Absolute domination. Mm-hmm. I thought he was such a dope character, big mm-hmm. fan. I'm excited to see what happens with the Warwick vibes. Uh, Cause obviously we saw that at the end with that little clip and I'm, I'm excited to Vander's Warwick. Yeah. I'm saying I mean, Vander's we're... Warwick. I think it's pretty fair. Yeah. I mean, his name is Vander. Like if that's not a war, if that's not like a war, a werewolf name, then <laughs> honestly, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Might as well name him Jacob and call it a day. Um, <laughs> that was a bad joke. Um, at least I think that that's the right name, right? I didn't mess that up. Team Jacob. Team okay, Edward, okay. Yeah. I was like, sorry, I've actually never, I don't really actually know that much. <laughs> I was like, I messed it up. Um, and then, so that was one, I, I really liked that. And then the other one uh, was the scene I was talking about earlier. Um, Echo and Jinx? With the Echo and Jinx scene. That, and, and, and the, the funny part is it's like them like imagining the fight between each other and then they actually fight. But that like imagination, the animation, well, it was, it was, it, it was like, it was almost like a combo in my head, right? Where I was like, wa- I was like watching it. Cause I wasn't actually sure because when I watched it the first time I was like, did Echo just go back in time? Yeah. Because Echo's te- power, tech based power is, yeah. is like a, a time leap, yep. right? Where he can like reverse, re- reverse polarity or whatever. You can use yeah. whatever science words you want um, and go back in time a few seconds. And he had his watch. He's all tick tock, tick tock, you know, before he got jammed. Um, but he like does the full combo and like that super cool, like growing up phase get loses the fight gets his booty slapped then reverses the time replays the same fight and dodges yeah. the attack and hits her yeah and i was like did he I, so I, I in my opinion what i think happens i think he was in his head yeah i think it was inside of echo's head and it was kind of showing off his future power it was like some foreshadowing showing yeah. like in the future this is kind of what happens and so it was kind of like a, a little teaser of that that he's such a smart fighter that he's that's that's why he can utilize that time skipping ability is mm-hmm. because he can like foresee. He can think. He can telegraph it, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that was something that was super, super interesting that I liked a lot. 
um, was that like whole fight scene in general because I was like, oh, it's like some foreshadowing and it's like some like throwback to like their their them like growing up and all this mm-hmm. stuff and like they both lost themselves as they were growing up. So it was just like so many. I was just like, I was all about it, bro. I was mm-hmm. like, Bleh. so that was sick. Yeah. I agree. Um, and my own, and I have another one. Last thing about that was the the fight choreography of Jason Vise two man oh. fight was super good. So like you know I, I like I like using this example. Um, Star Wars, the newer ones, whatever, yeah. where like Kylo the, Ren the and, sequel trilogy. and the, yeah. ch- the, the girl, whatever her name is, when those two like fight, like have actually like lightsaber fights, mm-hmm. some of the worst choreography I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Like ridiculous. Like you lost your arm, you killed yourself, that guy didn't, that guy killed you, but his thing, his, his lightsaber disappeared, so he missed apparently. Like yeah. literally just like, I can't even watch the movies because... I just, like, I feel like I'm watching a, a, a children's TV show. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, like, the fight makes no sense. Mm-hmm. And then I'm watching this literal god-tier built fight scene where these guys are just, like, perfectly countering punches and playing off their own weight and all this stuff. And I'm just, like, I'm, I'm a huge fan of fight choreography, and I think they did a really good job. I think it's uh, I think it's especially hard, too, where it feels like, and I won't go into a big tangent about Star Wars, but it feels like with a weapon. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think it actually, I think it actually illustrates a really good point. I feel like when you're fighting with a weapon like a lightsaber, where it feels like if you get struck once, you basically should lose the fight, right? Because if you get struck, you're probably losing a limb, or it's going through your chest, and you're dead. And I feel like it makes it hard. And this isn't like an excuse, but I feel it makes it hard to choreograph a fight like that because the stakes are almost like too high. It feels like it's too easy to lose where it feels like with a fist fight or a guy swinging around a hammer, it feels like the stakes uh, aren't as high all the time. Like you can get hit and you can get struck and then you can go back and it makes for a more interesting flow in the fight. And it makes it so that you can, I feel like you can actually have the viewer questioning whether they'll lose or you know, how badly will they come out of this fight, like, hurt or whatever. And I feel like with those kinds of weapons and the way they do those fights, like, you're – I feel like you just are given more to work with and you can do more with it. So I, I definitely think they did an accept job. the margin of error yes. like, to a certain extent. But also the amount of master tier sword choreographers that exist in this world. Sure. To not have even hired one for whatever your Star Wars production Fair budget point. was. Like, I watch literal – fencing mm-hmm. that is more interesting than that i watch literal lightsaber <laughs> fencing that i've seen uh, tiktok videos with better choreography than your whole movie chief like, I, again we're not talking about star wars but i I'm always saying, like I, I always think back to the scene at like early in the fight between anakin and obi-wan on mustafar where they're like on top of the table and they're like fighting and then there's that one point where i think like obi-wan's walking backwards and anakin's walking towards him and they're both like swinging their lightsabers in like circles or whatever but they actually aren't hitting each other or each other's lightsabers like they're just swinging them like this in front of each other and i always laugh so hard when i watch that because i'm like what are you doing none of that did anything like you're just like showing off i guess like you didn't try to hurt each but other it's about, or try to no block. it is about fight choreography like no, you I have agree. to keep no, the I momentum that, no, of the I weapon agree. going no i agree that's what i'm saying is like i think that choreography sucked like i think it was terrible and there's literally 5 seconds of choreography that literally means nothing and it's like why yeah. is it even there so i agree i thought the choreography was incredible it was fun to watch I also love, this goes back to, and I, I noticed this specifically in what, re-watching Act 2, the fight with Vi and um, who is yep. Silco's right yep. hand. She's got like the metal arm. Yep. That part where she grabs Vi, she like slams her against the wall and then spins her and then turns her up and slams her into the ground. The way they did like the cinematography there with like the camera movement that like basically mimics her spinning and turning and getting slammed, I was just like, oh, that is so cool. And I feel like there's so many little things like that in all of these fights throughout the show that I feel like elevate good fight scenes into incredible fight scenes. And it's like it's all those little stylistic touches. Same with like the Echo fight. I think there was mm. so much attention to detail in all of these parts of the show that just made it even more uh, amazing to watch so last thing i'll say about it i was watching the the uh 
Jace uh, Vi combo fight. Yeah. And I was watching my girlfriend who doesn't she plays League, but she hasn't yeah. played for a long time, so she's familiar ish or whatever, but it's so funny. She does she doesn't really know Jace at all. So the the fight's going on and I go, Hey babe, you wanna know what's cool about Jace's hammer? And like as it's happening, you know, like mm-hmm. the part where I'm seeing him swinging around, I go, It's also a crossbow and he's all <laughs> he's all boom, 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 and I'm all that was dope, Luke, nice job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I totally You're just over there on the Yeah, no, see no seriously though. Shoulders off. I'm all, uh, you know what's cool about his hammer? Yeah. As I see it charging up and him getting ready yeah. to blast and I'm all it's a crossbow. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah. It was really cool. It was also cool to see the uh, the turbo chem tank. All those guys. is like that's like oh, the item yeah, in the, the game with the, the purple. And like, yeah. dude, and seeing them like hauling ass around like body people was so sick. And I then was they like, got oh their gosh. asses beat. Oh, beat. they got walked on. Oh, yeah. Just seeing Vi jump up the first time and just absolutely yeah, Jason's all, that oh, we built them up. to mine, and buys yeah. all. No, you didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, you ready, pretty yeah. boy, with a big ass hand. Um, yeah. I, my final thoughts. Well done. I think the character arcs were, were incredible. I will say my only criticism is I felt like I wanted more Heimerdinger in the last part. We got very little. I guess in the end, his end of his arc was nowhere near as important and didn't have nearly as many stakes as the Jace, Victor, Vi, Jinx, Silco, all of those characters. And there's only so much you could do, but I will say I was like a little bummed because I really enjoyed Heimerdinger's character through the first arc, a couple of arcs, but incredible show, incredible finish. The only, so the well only done. person doesn't think that the show's incredible is Netflix. So because you can't find it on there, but good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, so, how is it not top 10? I don't know. Come on, Netflix. I don't know. That is the most marketing bull crap I've ever heard in my life. All I know is that it, they said season two is likely not going to happen in 2022, so we'll keep an eye out for 2023. But I, well, I cannot wait. What? That's what they said. Why would you say that? Oh, no. <laughs> I have to I wait. I mean, it makes sense. I have look, to wait a they whole put year six, and a... They put six years into this season, and granted... Uh, Probably a good chunk of that was like writing the story and where is this going to go and then casting people. Because I remember in the interviews like prior to the release of Act 1, they were talking about how long it took them to find like their jinx and their powder. So they don't necessarily have to do as much of that stuff. Um, You got any experience? I don't think so. Okay, I'll go with you if you want. I think I'm going to go. When is uh, That's like the Undercity Knights thing that they still have going on. When is it? It's like every day. Three showings a day, every day, from now all the way through like the 19th of December. Bro, it's like a. I'm LA like so tempted because I want to wear because you can. I saw you can like try on Vi's gauntlets and take a picture, and I'm just like, first of all, uh, I'm gonna have to like drizzle myself in hand sanitizer after that. <laughs> sorry, I just got so grossed out thinking about that. Actually, they probably make you put gloves on or something first. I hope. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just grossed out. Anyway, sorry. I, 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 I hear you. My germaphobia kicked in for a second, and I was like, ah, I can't put them on. Yeah. <laughs> um, that sounds dope. Uh, I think Luke's gonna show up with those like dishwasher gloves that your mom wears that like go up to her elbow. That's what Luke's gonna show up with to take the picture. It's better than nothing. He'll get a sick pic. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it's you know, it's like a it's a LA experience where you mm-hmm. can go and interact with the voice actors, the characters, the equipment, the world, mm-hmm. the storyline, the writers, the artists, mm-hmm. the food and drink that yeah. it's all themed and stuff like that so and it's honestly kind of it's kind of pricey i think it's like the cheapest like i think the, the cheapest ticket is like 80 bucks see that's the, the that's the hard part for me see i just feel like if it's cost that kind of like if it's like 80 bucks per person yeah. like minimum like it's, it's probably sick it's probably worth it's the money. gotta be it's gotta be sick yeah it looked know? cool all the pictures that so, i saw but no like incredible. i would have done it already if it didn't cost so much so yeah. I've, i'm definitely on the fence i'll let you know if i decide on a day also, my very little minor shout out is to, and I can't remember the character's name, but the, the voice actress who played that head enforcer from Act One. And she was the one that was like mentoring Caitlin and like the shooting thing or whatever. Her voice. You're vibing? So good. Mm. Like the smallest little touch, but like just listening to her voice, it was so cool. Well, there you she go. She was well done. Well shout performed. Shout out to character. voice actors across the board, honestly. Yeah. Great, great crew. Well done. Well done. Hats off to everybody at Riot and everybody who put the, together Arcane. Uh, special shout out, uh, specifically from Luke and I, to Fortiche, who did the animation. Gorgeous. Well done. If you haven't seen Arcane, mm. 
even if you've watched all the spoiler discussions and you're thinking, cool, that's enough, go watch the show. There's so much that Luke, like, it would, for Luke and I to cover every awesome thing in the show and It'd talk about everything podcast. we wanted to, we'd, I don't think even a whole podcast would do yeah. it justice. We'd need a few hours, so just go watch the show. It's amazing. It is well worth your time. It's on Netflix. My mom hates animated shows that, like, aren't Pixar, and she literally asked me to come over this weekend to watch part two with her. So if that isn't an endorsement enough, I don't know what to tell you. JC's mom says go watch it. Go watch it. Yes. Luke, uh, as we close out episode 14, what have you been playing? I mean, I know what you've been playing. Wait, tell the people what you've been wait, playing. 13 or 14? 14. Did oh I say 13? I meant to say 14. I don't even know what number okay. we're on anymore. 14. One I'll, four. Leave it, I'll leave it to you. Um, what have I been playing? Halo Infinite, of course. Hanging out in Plat, trying to trying to cruise my way to Diamond. Yes, sir. Um, Same. So I've been playing a lot of that. Pokemon Diamond, of course. Just got my seventh gym badge. Continuing to cruise through. I'm currently... I'm, I'm dealing with the, the galactic stuff, and then I'm about to get my legendary before I go do the eighth and, nice. and that kind of jazz. Um, so that should be good. I'll be done with that probably the next day or two, which would be nice. I, don't, I haven't decided if I'm going to do a complete dex yet or not. Um, I don't think I'm going to. I don't really see a point to do it. I'm so going to complete my dex and sword and shield. I feel That's like I'll probably not. I already did that, so I don't. You're so cool, Luke. Nah, you know, which is fine. But I'm excited just yeah. to beat the game and, move, and keep gaming because there's been so many games I've been playing recently, mm -hmm. so... Uh, really, just Halo and, and, and Pokemon has been my week. So nice. that's I, if you're playing anything else, I don't really know how you yeah. have time. But that, that's it. That's yeah. what I'm playing. I'm assuming you're similar. Yeah, it's been the same for me. Really enjoying Infinite. Uh, I didn't put as much time into Pokemon over the weekend, but I'm definitely going to be getting back to that. This week, played it for a few hours last night, building out a good, like I already have a good chunk of my like late, tame, late game team already set, and I haven't even gotten the third badge. So I'm very happy about that. Just of all my Lux Ray. Nice. Got my Crow Bat. Very nice. close to getting my Empoleon. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. Um, and Halo Infinite's been incredible. I've been playing that a ton. It's little TFT. Cool to, uh, a little TFT. Oh, okay. You uh, you played around with the duos mode, right? Yeah. Did you like it? It's okay. It's all right. Okay. It's, it's fun enough to play once in a while for fun. If they added a rank mode to it and like refined it a little bit, I'd probably okay. I'd probably play it a decent amount. Okay. But overall, it's it's pretty much just like playing alone. Luke needs those <laughs> extra stakes. If you haven't figured that out yet, he's not gonna play just regular normals. It's like I won't he's like, that, if yeah. I can't get LP or rank up, why am I even playing? That's exactly how I feel. Yeah, I'm just so, too competitive. Yeah, I get too bored. Yeah, it feels like I'm wasting time. I'd rather really just play a single player game and yep. accomplish my own achievements instead. I hear you there. Yeah. Uh, that's what we've been playing. Let us know what you guys have been playing. If you guys have any questions, anything you guys want us to talk about on the show, hit us up on Twitter. Luke is at Shimonahi. I'm at Caster Yeso. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening to another episode, folks. 14 in the books. If you're looking out for any future episodes, we are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as over at youtube.com forward slash esports arena. Just search Eat, Speak, Compete on any of those platforms. You will find us there. We are going to take next week off. Uh, we've got some big stuff going on. We'll be here for draft day for Apex Legends Series E as well as Guilty Gear Strive. That'll be next Wednesday and Thursday, December 1st and 2nd. So if you want to check that out, check us out at twitch.tv forward slash esports arena. But we'll take next week off of the podcast. We'll be back the week after, which I believe is the week of the 6th. So we'll be back that time. Enjoy uh, your Thanksgiving, everybody. Enjoy your holidays. We'll see you again soon.